I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, and this is Work Life Confidential, where we share critical thinking on leadership, on parenting, on relationships of all kinds. And I am thrilled to have my friend Hyann M. with me today, and I'll introduce her in just a minute. We're going to talk about the recent massacre in Atlanta and other aspects of anti-Asian hate. And we're going to locate that in the broader picture of white supremacy. And then we're gonna share some thoughts on steps forward. I am very happy to introduce Haiyan. She is Korean American, she's a writer and she's a wonderful person. Hey, Haiyan. Well, thank you. Well, you're a wonderful person too. <laughs> hello, hello. So this is a letter that was sent two days after the, after the, Atlantic, after the Atlanta shootings. Yeah. Uh, so it was two days sent after and it sent to the widow of Pyong. His first name is Pyong. Pyong Che is his name. So I'm going to read the letter and she will, she will m mention his name. Hmm. The letter is, now that Pyong is gone, makes it one less Asian to put up with in leisure world. You frickin' Asians are taking over our American community, exclamation point. It is not resting well with all and everybody who lives here. True statement. Watch out. Pack your bags and go back to your country where you belong. My parents live in the same retirement community, so it struck me very personally. So this letter comes out, gets coverage, and that's when the other letters went out. So, so the, the, the people who wrote the other letters saw this letter in the paper. I mean, all the papers show the letter, and they felt emboldened um, to send letters themselves. To, uh, they sent them to uh, nail salons. Yeah. Run by yeah. Asian, Asian women. I've been in communication with some people, some white people, who say that things like this are isolated incidents and that these kinds of sentiments and these kinds of actions are, are not representative of any sort of pattern. What do you say to that, given your own experience? Well, what I say to that is uh, the facts. I mean, it's evidence-based that there's, it's, there's a pandemic, but there's also a pandemic of anti-Asian Racism, xenophobia, anti-Asian sentiment, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's virulent and there's plenty of documentation. You just go through the papers. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been anti-Asian crimes. They're not investigated as hate crimes in many cases. So that, that's an issue too. Yep. But there, there, has been, there has been significant abuse right from the beginning. After the shootings, my mother called me and she said, Do not, don't go outside. There's a history of Asian people in this country getting killed. When we were living in Detroit, my father said, he said often, they want to kill us. They want to kill us. He said that a lot. For me, it's important to acknowledge that there was never anything like that said in my family. It was never, it was never the case that we had to be, us kids had to be told to be fearful of just being in the public world. That's something that is fundamental to the privilege of being white in, in my view and in my experience. And you know, there's, the, there's a long history of, of violence toward Asians in this society, correct? There's been a lot, considerable violence. I mean, in the 1800s, uh, Chinese men were getting lynched. We can get to 1982, mm -hmm. and we could talk about Vincent Chen. He was um, in, in Detroit, and uh, he was beaten to death, bludgeoned to death by two white men with a baseball bat and their hands, and they, they, there were racial slurs, and they beat him up because they killed him because... They assumed he's Japanese. It doesn't matter that he was actually Chinese, you know. At that time, uh, the Japanese car imports, that was, you know, one of the reasons why the Detroit auto companies uh, went downhill. And so these were two laid off auto workers and they beat him, they beat him to death. And um, as we see now with, with the police, you know, with uh, so many African-American killings by the police, we see them getting off and not, not getting, uh, you know, commensurate uh, punishment. 
you know, in the legal sense. Well, this happened with Vincent Chin. These two men were given a fine of $5,000 mm -hmm. and um, they didn't get any jail time. They didn't spend a day in jail. They got away with it. Yeah. Scott Free and Vincent Chin's mother, mother and yeah. really? specifically activists, not, not mm -hmm. the whole community. They made it a big story. I, and I was, you know, I was old enough to remember it. And it, it kind of became the turning point for defining what a hate crime is. As long as racism exists, uh, there will be anti-Asian racism because we do not have European features. Yeah. You know, yeah. so this, this thing called white is a social construct. And um, at, one, at, at one point in history, Italians were not white. There yeah. were Italians that were lynched. Greeks yeah. were not white. Jews were certainly not white. But yep. they're all in, in what I call the white club. Yep. But I will never be invited into the white club. And I am very happy about that because I do not have European features. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, this whole race thing is about phenotype. It's about how we look. Um, well, so well, it's like it's like the what we spoke about recently with the Japanese internment. Many people lost their life savings, their family's property for generation. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible crime in many, many different areas of these people's lives. We didn't see that toward Germans. No. We didn't see it toward Italians. No. And, and again, it, every, when it comes to race, this specter of white supremacy organizes everything. It organizes our society. We, we talked recently about how my father was a very dark olive skinned Italian and he grew up in a in an Italian enclave in Rhode Island where the trolley cars would come through and people would throw rotten fruit at the the residents shouting things like hold your nose we're going through the guinea switch and and you look at me and as we were talking recently and my dad and his brothers who knows the who knows in what way they were making this choice very deliberately but they married women who were very fair skinned and my mom was swedish and all of us the three sons have skin color like me i mean we're pale 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 that's part of the story of assimilating to whiteness right absolutely there was some discussion with my parents, they were thinking of naming me Pasquale. That's my grandfather's mm -hmm. name. And mm -hmm. they decided not to, they tried to, decided to name me Kenneth Robert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's a, if you were named Pasquale, uh, just think, you know, how your life would have been so different. I mean. Might have been quite different. And, and, and in fact, my grandfather, whose name was Pasquale, they, everybody called him Pat. That's how it was anglicized. It's all part of white supremacy, right? It's all part of this sense that you, we've got patriarchy, which is men asserting dominance over women. We have racism, which is the child of patriarchy, the way I see it. It's, it's looking at skin color as a way of ranking and justifying oppression, ranking people according to their skin color, according to their features, making up the story of race, making it up, of course, yes. as you said, because race yes. is, a, is an absurd, it's not a biological reality, it's a social construct. And it translates this idea of power over, power is domination, translates to every conceivable difference, whether it's well, you know, gender or race or ability status or, or yeah, sexual orientation, disability, every, every conceivable, looks, body type, Everything is stratified and, and whiteness and maleness and straightness and a certain kind of body type is generally prioritized in terms of value. What do you think are the key points that it would be important to leave people with having this kind of a conversation, you and I? Well, people need to know certain facts. Stop AAPI hate. Um, that is a organization they monitor um, anti-Asian incidents and uh, they collect data. And so, in the year 2020, 
and these are just the ones that are reported. They, they, there were 3,800 hate incidents. That was a 149% spike than the year before, 149% spike. Wow. So that's in 2020. So what makes me very angry is the authorities, you know, like, like, you know, the, the mayor and, and the police force. I mean, what, don't these figures mean something? It took this Atlanta shooting for the police, police nationwide. All of a sudden they form units. Mm. They form units uh, to patrol Asian areas um, to, to support, you know, in the language to support, um, you know, Asian communities and the media. Yeah. All of a sudden, the media is like in overdrive to talk about Asian Americans. And uh, so people are getting educated. People are also very surprised. Oh, I didn't know people were doing that to Asians. Are Asian people surprised? No. Like I said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 27 governors signed a letter condemning anti-Asian hate crimes. Condemning it, and this this was. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I I'm really happy that they did that, and I I you know respect them that they did that, but but again, they you know they they were not they were not paying attention to us, you know. People had heard that there were you know Asian people being hit at the beginning of the pandemic. People knew all of that, you know. So if you have um, a, a a number of uh, people that are attacked. If you have uh, uh, people that are walking around, you know, saying making racial slurs, then you know you should put those facts together and think, oh, maybe maybe there's some anti-Asian uh, sentiment going on. And the House Democrats in March of 2021, they had their first congressional hearing on anti-Asian discrimination in three decades. Three wow. decades. What does it, yeah, what it takes, what it takes to get some attention to something that's been going on for as long as there have been people of Asian background in this society. I grew up with this. I mean, yeah. that's one of the reasons why the letter, when I read the letter, it just, it was like a knife in my, in my heart. It, you know, I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but it really, it felt that way because uh, it was so, you know, overt and explicit and I thought about my parents and um, you know got really afraid for them. Everybody knows Trump called it the uh, the kung fu uh, kung flu flu and uh, the China China Chinese uh, virus. Yeah. Uh, so they should look at those those uh, factors and uh, recognize that there probably is anti-Asian sentiment. It should not have to take a mass murder. But it should not have to take a mass murder, and yet it did. And, and one thing that I'm, I'm thinking as well as you're talking is the way that we forget that the people who have power, relative power and privilege, forget all of the horrors that people like us have inflicted on people whose identity puts them in a different place at least in part, because we're all a, mi a mix of identity characteristics, but the, the, the history of atrocious violence toward people of Asian background, and that we should expect that there are threads of that that are going to always be present unless we're really trying to end it. We're really trying to fight against it in every, every relationship, every institution, including every workplace, every community, every elder community. We, we have to be vigilant about this and really working to see it and to try to confront it and change it. That's, that's the way I, that's, that's what I take away from what you've Yes, done. absolutely, I agree with you. It's important to acknowledge history. It's yeah. important to know history, you know, at least, no history.